Welcome to the Rose Show podcast. Hey, Brennan, how are you? Hi, Rosanna. So proud of you. You you're so young and you're doing so great and you're doing so many wonderful Thank things. Thank you. Appreciate you. I um, look up to you so. guys as well. I mean, like obviously we had that call and what you guys have done is like yeah. a dream come true. So it's it's amazing for everybody listening today, guys. Mm-hmm. Rosanna's story is amazing as well as Frank's. Um, and mm-hmm. also shout out to Anna. She's in the uh, crowd right now listening. She's one of my Budge Dog Academy students. Oh, awesome. Shout out. Shout out to her. Awesome. I'm glad you're she's here. Um, so yeah, I think we can get started now. Um, and, um, we have lots to talk about. I'm so excited. This is so awesome. So we're the, we're the old toads here, I guess <laughs> my husband and I, you're the young generation. So, um, this is, this would be great. We're all going to come together meeting of the minds, you know, so this yes. will be great. Awesome. So, okay. So welcome everyone. And thank you for joining us. I'm Rosanna and I'm here with Brennan Schlagbaum, CPA entrepreneur, a.k.a. Budget Dog, and also my husband, Frank Prestia, JD attorney and a serial entrepreneur. Today, we'll be discussing investing, estate planning, some taxes, and most importantly, entrepreneurship and financial freedom. We are here today to share great ideas to inspire you to be your best. And we're looking forward to learning from one another. Quick disclaimer. Please do not construe this as investment, legal, tax, or financial advice. So let's begin with the budget dog himself, Brennan. Thank you so much for being here today. How are you doing? I know you moved to Texas recently. How's everything? I'm excited to be here for one. Uh, For two, we are, you know, we don't even have a couch right now in our house, guys. (laughs) So the move to Texas has been phenomenal. Uh, we are kind of adjusting, I guess you could say, but our house is still, you know, out of, we're still getting furniture and things of that nature. So we're trying to get in here and feel comfortable, make it feel homey. And we've been here about since January 3rd. So it's fairly recent. Uh, and for those that don't know, the reason for the move was all because of my daughter. So she has something called Dravet syndrome, um, a form of epilepsy, and we need to get her the best care in the world. And uh, Texas was where that that location was at. So we decided with, you know, the financial move to come down here and it's been amazing. I mean, it's, it's obviously what we fight for financial freedom every day for is for what's important in our lives. And so to have this opportunity to just get up and leave our, you know, place in Cincinnati where we loved to get my daughter the best care in the world is means everything. Um, And that's where we're at today. That's so wonderful to hear family first and to have that freedom to make that choice to just pick up and leave. That is true wealth. And that's what we're here to talk about today because my husband and I, Frank and I have lived that life. Fortunately, we worked really hard and I'll tell you that we worked really hard throughout our lives, but we've afforded that freedom for many years now and we've traveled around and we can talk a little bit about that. But if we get talking about that, we'll be here all for, for, for days, <laughs> but um, we've moved all over because we just wanted to be in a different place. And um, so, yeah, that freedom is key. And I think that's so rewarding that you're there for your daughter um, and, and God bless her. And hopefully, you know, she is, will have the best treatment possible in, in there in Dallas, mm-hmm. Texas. Um, so I wish you guys the best with that. Um, Brennan, you know, you help so many people and that's, that's the key here. You're a giver and just like we are, you know, it's important. I think only in giving do we truly receive. And could you just tell us a little bit about yourself, how this whole thing began and how you escaped the nine to five? Yeah, it's crazy. Um, A little bit of background on myself, guys, is like I'm 31 now. And so at 23 years old, we started this whole financial journey ourselves, like my wife and I, and we had a ton of debt to our name. Uh, Specifically, we had 76,000 of non-mortgage debt and 228,000 of mortgage debt fresh out of school. You know, that included student loans, uh, engagement ring, the bed we slept in, um, obviously the mortgage itself, cars, you name it, we had it, right? And it was kind of like, you know, it was just part of our lives. It was part of the payments we were making and it was just kind of normalized and I kind of came to the conclusion pretty quickly right after school was like, what did we just get ourselves into? It was just a lot to handle at a 23 year old age and just getting into the workforce and living on our own and all that kind of stuff. And 
we came to the realization, like, you know, we need to do something about this. And so we did. And we attacked it really, really quickly. And we just said, we're enough's enough. We're going to get out of debt. And I started sharing our journey online throughout this process. And I didn't really even start this budget dog account because I saw some like 10 year plan of like financial freedom and building a business by any means. But really what I did was it was kind of bloggy style. You know, we, uh, we had a, you know, a blog or we had a, we have a blog, you know, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, et cetera. And we were just sharing our story and people connected very well with it because it was very relatable and people started reaching out for, you know, to, to get help. And so I was helping people locally, friends and family and stuff like that. And they were getting really, really good results, like really quickly. And I was kind of surprised because I didn't really put a whole lot of effort into the tools I had. It was just kind of what I used personally. I threw them at their way and explained how to use them. And everyone's like, man, I paid off this debt and I paid off that debt and I invested this and that. I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. Like, that's really awesome to see that you guys are growing. And, you know, people started asking me online, can I help you? And I honestly had no services. I had no products. I had no services. I was just literally talking about our story. And so I realized, hey, I need to create something to help people do what we've done. And so I started basically just molding our personal situation and our personal resources into a framework that I, I now sell today as Budget Dog Academy. Um, and it's just a really practical way from if you're starting, if you don't know how to get out of debt, if you don't know how to invest, if you're just starting fresh, no idea where to begin, to start this program from A to Z roadmap and just get your finances in order altogether. Um, and so, yeah, the, the business has bloomed and it's been amazing. And uh, I'm so grateful every day to be in a position that I am to help people financially all over the world and be able to stay home with my, my family, you know, my daughter and my wife at the moment. Uh, and so that's where we're at right now. So, you know, I think one of the cool things about this business is it, it started as just a, a hobby and me wanting to help people. And it's kind of turned into something way bigger than I ever expected. I love that. That's so inspiring um, how you transformed to, you know, you did it for your, you did it for yourself. And then now you're a role model for others and you're helping others also escape that nine to five mentality. It's like breaking away from the ordinary. Um, sometimes I say it's like a hamster wheel we're on and we, we think we need to have all these things that I think society conditions us to believe. And we really don't need all these things. And, um, you know, kudos to you at 23 to wake up and to realize that. I uh, give you a lot of credit for that. Um, thank you so much for sharing that um, with us. Now, Frank, the ultimate pragmatic out of the box thinker, um, he's been an entrepreneur since I met him and we've been together almost 25 years. Um, please um, tell us, tell everyone a little bit about yourself. Hi, thank you, Rosanna, for having me on. And uh, hi, Brennan. Nice to speak or participate together. I, I hate labeling myself. I try not to label because label requires judgment on things and um I just, I basically just, everything I do is with the end in mind. And the end in mind for me, it's the legacy I'm going to leave for myself, you know, for my children, people that know me. And I sort of just, that's just basically the overriding um, thing about me and what drives me. So I know Rosanna's probably looking for labels and things like that. And I just... I just think like when getting into anything, it's better to be into the fundamentals and kudos to you, Brennan. It's not the idea. It's not following your passion. It's actually doing it and getting it done. That's perfect. Exactly the out-of-box thinker. So uh, you answered it your way. So that's great. Um, well, I guess you, you guys both share the same birthday, December 27th. Great day, by the way. Uh, Capricorn. I did not know that. <laughs> Happy yeah. coincidence. Yeah. Happy coincidence. Exactly. I, saw that. I didn't know that as well. Yeah, okay, it's a special so. day. <laughs> um, you know, I want to delve right into the big topic here, financial freedom. And I think ultimately it all centers around that freedom. And I always say that true wealth is freedom. So, Brennan, please, I want to begin with you. Let's speak about your view on financial freedom and I know it centers around paying off debt. So please enlighten us. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to start off by sharing a tweet I made this morning. So I don't know if I can share this in the group. I think I might have just shared it officially. So um, this is my idea of financial freedom, guys. Nothing more, nothing less. I don't think it's 
a crate. I don't, I'm not one to go buy the Lamborghini or the big house. Again, nothing wrong with it by any means. It just doesn't appeal to me. Right. But what, what appeals to me is this. And so literally having the first hour of my day watching what's called Miss Rachel, I found out, <laughs> which I learned that this morning um, with my daughter was that's financial freedom to me in a nutshell. So, you know, we could go buy the, the latest and greatest gadgets and phones and um, cars and homes and clothes. But like, what, what are we trying to get out of life? And our money is a tool to get those things that we want out of life. And so it's no more or no less is um, a money being a tool. And so, you know, when you treat it as a God or you treat it as all being, I think it becomes a very dangerous path that you're on your way to your heading. And so if you can really ask yourself, what are your values? What do you want to get out of life? You're going to come, come to the conclusion of like your own really makeup and uh, value system, which is extremely powerful in my opinion. Um, and it's getting really, really uh, vulnerable with yourself in a sense. And so I think that's what we've really, really asked ourselves the last five to seven years during this process is what do we really want? And we've come to that conclusion um, time and time again. So, you know, one of those things back at 23 was my mindset wasn't right. And I don't think, you know, we, we started on the journey and we wanted to attack debt, but I still wasn't there mentally. Um, I still needed to get past that invisible glass right in front of my face of saying, I can't be wealthy. I'm not worthy. Whatever negative cognition was, I was telling myself or making up in my head. And so, you know, being online has been one of the most powerful things. Connecting with people like you, Rosanna and Frank is like showing what's possible and, and seeing what's out there. I used to say every time I saw somebody online with like a flashy, you know, car or whatever, oh, that's just fake or that's just blah, blah, blah. To be honest, I've met a lot of people online and they really have that stuff and they really build this wealth and they really make that money, that much money. And so I've conditioned myself and changed myself into believing and taking that invisible glass away. It's like, I can do this and so can you. And so, you know, that might sound guru like, and I, I know I get that from time to time. It's like, well, I can't really do that. It's just a limiting belief. It really is. Um, and it's woke me up entirely when I saw the people around me doing a hundred X what I do. I mean, what I do right now is nothing cons comparing to my, my buddy in Puerto Rico who does $40 million a year. And so I used to tell, I used to have this, like, you know, just this self disciple or self uh, limiting belief in myself is like, what's out there and what people are really doing isn't real. And like, it's just a, it's just a show on Instagram and sure there's some accounts like that, <laughs> that might rent the Lamborghini, but there's a lot of people that are actually doing this guys. And it's not as made up and far fetched as you know, and there's so many resources right in front of us, whether it be online or in person is we all can build incredible things. You just have to start by believing and finding out what you're passionate about and then attacking and actually taking action on that plan. Um, I talked to, you know, Anna is in here listening, like, you know, one of my students and she's one of my you know best students out there because she takes action. She actually does the work we talk about. And I tell every student that comes into my academy, I can give you guys the exact blueprint, but if you don't do it and I will even try to hold you accountable as much as I possibly can. But at the end of the day, you have to want it as more than I do, because it's just like going to the gym. If the trainer shows up at the gym and you don't show up. You can't get mad at the trainer. You got to get mad at yourself and you got to be real with yourself um, and take self you know, accountability, which I, I believe is a lost art in, in 2023. Um, but accountability and taking action and consistency, these things, and, and also believing, um, truly believing that you can do it and finding a pathway to get to that end goal versus just dreaming to dream, um, but turning your, rea your dreams into a reality. And so um, that's financial freedom in a nutshell, guys, spending the time with the loved ones that you, um, you care most about. Agree. Absolutely. Um, uh, mindset is everything and you need to be, as you said, accountable. You have to, um, be honest with yourself and that's so important. And if you have the true goal of being free, having financial freedom, you do need to make the sacrifices and you have to stay consistent, disciplined. And there's, I think there's a quote out there that says the difference between dreams and reality is discipline. And, you know, it's important to have a plan. Uh, I always speak about um, a business is like your life. You can, they're analogous to each other. And you need to, just like you do in a business, you want to increase your margins. You need to do the same with your life and your income and expenses. 
So like you mentioned about people buying flashy like Lambo Lamborghinis or, or watches or and things. It's like, to me, wealth is about experiences and spending time together with your loved ones. And, um, you know, there are a lot of expenses you can reduce that you don't need. And you want to increase those margins. You don't necessarily have to make all this money. And, in, and people always think they have to go increase their income. But if you kept your income the same and you actually just reduce your expenses, you're widening that margin. And that is, um, you know, that's what's going to get you to that path that you want to be where you want to go. So you have to be conscious of your decisions. It's just like going to the gym. You know, you have to make that commitment and you have to continue and you have to make that decision. It's about building up those habits over time and making those conscious efforts to continue. And that's, I think, the hard part. You know, anyone can have the goal and, and come up with it and, say, and get started. But it's really following through and staying consistent over time. And um, I mean, that's a challenge for everyone. You know, we're humans. You know, we have emotions, we have impulses. And, you know, it's not about reducing the emotions. It's actually more about using them to fuel us, the passion. And we can use emotions in a positive way. So, um, and I've been studying behavioral economics a lot lately. That was one of my fields of study. And um, so there's just so much out there. And, you know, it's just about mindset. And that's what it comes down to. Positive growth, empowered mindset. Anything is possible. Frank, what do you have to say about this? Growing up, I would, I would have to work with my dad on Saturday to be able to see him. Um, some, if he worked Sunday, I would go work with him too. And, uh, you know, it was the time I got to spend with him because at night when he'd come back, he'd be tired or, you know, whatever. So for me, from an early age, I sort of just thought everything we had wasn't even money. It was time and time I wouldn't get to see him. And, um, and so like growing up, I always thought every time I go to buy something, I never looked at it as like $5 or $10. I used to think how many hours or how many newspapers or how many, um, you know, I used to go door to door selling, you know, when people used to sell like holiday cards, you know, back in, you know, the seventies, people used to, you know, little kids used to go do stuff like that. Um, sell chocolates door to door, whatever it was, I'd be like, well, how many of these things would I have to sell? in order to be able to buy something like that. And just growing up, you know, I've always just looked at it that way. I've never looked at it as money per se. I looked at it at a more fundamental level as how much work, how much of my life do I have to give up to actually have that money? So I, I just remember like, boy, I would never buy anything because it was like, boy, that, that was like a whole bunch of days. That was like a week's worth of work um, going to do this. And, um, you know, in time, so it's like, oh, I, I've got to get motivated to make, uh, make my time more profitable at some point. So it was actually a really good movie, I think, called In Time with Justin Timberlake. I think uh, Amanda Seyfried, right? something like that. Anyway, but it was basically in the future, people don't have currency. They have their time. And it's a time stamp sort of that's on their wrist. And so anytime you go to buy like something to drink, something to eat, they scan you and it lessens the amount of time. Basically, the Earth's been it's a dystopian, uh, but the Earth's been overpopulated. So basically, everyone has to die at a certain age. So you, I forgot how many hours you're given, but that's the date. That's the hour you die. So when you work, they recharge you and they give you more hours. And every time you consume something, spend money you're not money, you're spending your time. So you, you actually see the amount of hours you have left, seconds you have left for everything you do. And um, when I was watching, I was like, all right, cool. Like this is, um, you know, this is a great example, you know, just to, you know, because when we talk about freedom to do this, freedom to do that, to spend time with people and everything, we, we really need to think fundamentally e even about that time. You know, like when I'm with my my kids now, they're teenagers. It's a, there's a big difference between, OK, let's be together. And if they're on their computers or I'm reading a book or if I'm on a phone versus we're just really together. 
valuable time, the time that you're giving up. It's all about time. And whether you're studying, whatever you got to do, you know, give it your best, do it 100%. And um, like I said, so when I think of purchasing stuff or people driving around with their cars or whatever they have, I just think of, I don't think of them, but when you guys are talking about the examples, you know, everything I look at is, okay, how much time did I have to take uh, dedicate of my life to get this? And I think if you do that, um, I'm not sure if it makes you more thrifty per se, but you're going to make sure that whatever you, you do purchase, you're something you're going to enjoy and use uh, a lot more. You'll be a lot more discriminating. At, le- at least that's my opinion. Thank you so much. Um, you, you touched upon something great, um, charity and giving to others. That's so important. That's part of the freedom that we have is that we can um, spend time helping others. And our kids, we homeschooled them for most of the time. They were traveling with chess for many years and they were they were all uh, professional chess players, um, masters and experts. And so we traveled the world and the US um, for a few years with them. And we were able to afford that, being able to do that because we had that freedom. So we did that for about, I think, five years or something like that. I'm probably off by a year or two, but, um, you know, and so we were able to fulfill their dreams and to do what they wanted, what they were really, they, they worked really hard. And so, um, you know, it's about time and that's the key. That's a finite resource. We all have limited amount of time. We don't know when the time will end. So ultimately we want to make each day the best possible and um, be able to make the choices we want. So, and that's going to segue to my favorite topic uh, next to financial freedom, which goes hand in hand with financial freedom, entrepreneurship. And um, we are serial entrepreneurs. Frank and I are partners in most of them. Um, And from health clubs to consulting to franchise, I mean, what is it? Commercial real estate brokerage. Uh, I was the broker. You were the other broker. You're the, an attorney. Frank's an attorney as well. But entrepreneurship, Brennan, at such a young age, you realize this. You left your nine to five and you went out on your own. How many years has, has it been now? And tell everyone how your experiences have been, how it is, how it feels. And what it really means to be an entrepreneur. Yeah, that's awesome. And guys, I just want to say, Rosanna and Frank, you guys are obviously role models. Like what you guys have been able to accomplish is a dream, like literally a dream. Um, it's it's amazing what, what I've seen you guys do. And, um, you know, we had a brief conversation, Rosanna and I, about kind of the successes these two have seen. And it's literally unbelievable. Like the fact that you guys invited me to this is just awesome. So um, I'm going to say this first is we have been, I, I have been an entrepreneur since, um, I was a little kid. Um, I didn't really come to the awareness level I was. And so I went to school. I went to the four years of college at the university of Louisville. I got my CPA degree or CPA license and I headed to Deloitte and Touche as a CPA auditor for about six years. I made my way up to manager. And like during that process, I realized how much I just disliked working for somebody else and it was there was no spite towards a boss in particular or anything like that it was just I just like to run my own schedule I'm very proactive I I kind of do things on my own and so I don't really need that individual telling me hey you need to do x y and z I know what I need to do and I'll do it and above and beyond and so that's something I've always done my whole life and I realized when I was five years old I started my own beekeeping business like not even kidding like so since I was five yeah it sounds silly but like there was always some uh business model or something I was trying to do, whether it was trading like Pokemon cards and like trying to like um, figure ways to do that or starting mini businesses um, with laminated cards, walking around my neighborhood, knocking on doors for five, $5 to exterminate their bees with bats. Like that was literally what we did. <laughs> but um, I, I realized it was always in me. And when I was working at Deloitte, I started interviewing other places. And one of those places was Dave Ramsey's company. And so he was um, offering me a spot and to be wanting one of the uh, uh, the personalities there. And I, I was through the interviews process. I was doing, you know, I was on, I think, three, third or fourth interview. And they asked me to come down to Franklin, Tennessee to actually meet in person. This was during the COVID boom. So you couldn't really, you know, obviously meet in person at that time. And so one thing my wife told me that stuck with me forever. She's like, you're never going to work for somebody. Give it up. And I was like, 
oh, you're probably you're probably right. There's something to this. And she's like, I've been telling you this for five years. You're not you're you're not happy at Deloitte. You're not going to work for Deloitte and you're not going to work for somebody else. You're going to work for yourself. And I like came to that conclusion, like for the first time in my life that, hey, I am a natural entrepreneur. I am always, you know, I, I have it in me to do this and go full time. And so within a year from that, her telling me that is when I left my nine to five from Deloitte. And I realized I put all of my chips into my business. I believed in myself fully. And that's a scary leap to take, even at this point in time, like even a year, two years removed from leaving that nine to five, there are still days that I'm like, I get a little anxiety. I get a little fear, you know, that kind of crosses my mind, crosses my body, but I kind of let, let that go and realize I'm here to help people. And as long as I have a, a good place in my heart to help others, things are going to, positive things are going to happen. And so I've kind of let go of like, Hey, I got to hit this benchmark every single month, or I got to hit this number every single month. And I'm just myself now. And I think that has been one of the biggest changes over the two years I've been doing this thing for myself. You know, initially it was like, how can I, how can I game plan to build this or build that? Um, how do I hit this number? And now it's, Hey, how many people can I actually help in a given, given month and not change who I am as a result? And that has been a huge shift in, in my profits even, which is crazy to think about. It's like the, the more I'm giving, the more I'm thinking about how can I provide value, the more income that comes in naturally versus me trying to squeeze every dollar out and not really, uh, you know, do it out of a good place in my heart. And so that's been one of the biggest things. I, if you guys are on my email list, I, uh, I sent out an email. I'm pretty real. I'm pretty raw with, with most of my uh, Budget Dog Academy members and also my email list. I just tell you guys how I feel a lot of times. And um, I'm pretty in tune with that. So, you know, I think it was August of 2021. The first two months was like a high, right? I left, I left Deloitte. I left my nine to five. I paid off my house. Um, I, my, uh, about three weeks later, my daughter was born. I bought my wife a Peloton as a push gift type deal. Uh, there was just like so many things going on. I traveled out to California, <laughs> partied on a yacht, believe it or not, with Chris Johnson, with the Wealth Squad. It was just a really cool experience. And it was kind of like that ideal, like what people think of entrepreneurship. And then it got to October. The weather got worse you know, profits were the same. Everything was kind of flowing like normal. And I realized, Hey, I got to do something now. Like this is me. Like this is an everyday thing. I got to bring an income, um, to support my family. And at that point in time, I had a really, really dark, like dark time for a very short amount, amount of time, but, but nonetheless, a pretty dark time, just like so much anxiety and so much, you know, nervousness and just, can I do this and self doubt. And that was about, a, I'd say a one to two month period. And I came out of that period into 2022 on fire because I realized the feelings I felt were just normal. It was change. It was new. And if I let myself fall victim to those feelings, I was going to put myself in a, a bigger hole. And so I let go of those feelings because, you know, a feeling is a feeling and that's about what it is. And I just realized I focused on the mission, um, the mission to basically educate financially your financially educate millions of people and that's my mission and it has been since the beginning and i find myself getting off course from time to time getting distracted you know an opportunity comes my way and i have to realize instead of getting so sidetracked by all these other things which is so easy to do as an entrepreneur focus on your mission that you're trying to accomplish at all times and if those activities or those calls or those that time spent isn't in line with your mission, ask yourself what your mission is and make sure you get back on track. I love that. I love that. You touched upon so many things that I actually was going to mention. I'm going to add to it, to that. First of all, when we spoke on the phone, I have to say, I loved speaking with you. I could, I could feel that drive. I, I could sense that drive, that motivation in you that resembled me and Frank many years ago. And I love it. I always, I told you after we talked, I said, you're going to make it great. You're going to make it big. And um, I love it. And that energy you have is such a motivator for other people. And, you know, I call myself, I mean, well, many actually other people call me a catalyst. I'm a catalyst for people. I try to ignite change and energize and um, motivate people. And you have that. And I, I love that. I admire that. And, you know, that's what we're here for. We're a network of support for other entrepreneurs. You know, I've done this entrepreneur now for like, what, 25 years? So I could tell you every feeling you had is absolutely normal. 
you wake up with doubt. You feel like, well, what am I doing? What, what, how do I know if the money's even going to come in? You know, you don't have that steady paycheck. So doubt always seeps in. Let those feelings come and fade. They're only feelings. And there's a great philosopher, actually, Frank's one of his Frank's professors. It was amazing. Um, I wrote a book about that that talks about how feelings are normal, but they're just feelings and you need to experience them and let them go away. And then they'll eventually fade. And then you focus on your mission, as you said. Um, and that's that's what it's all about. You focus on the process. You don't think of the results. I mean, you have your goals, but you don't think of the money coming in. You think you love the process. You're passionate about it. As we all are. I mean, serial entrepreneur is like loving the process of turning creative ideas repeatedly into businesses. Um, not all successful, of course not. You know, failure precedes success. It's about embracing those failures, those mistakes. As serial entrepreneurs, we're inherently lifelong learners. I mean, that's what I am. I call myself a philomath because. It's, you know, I'm always learning. There's a new challenge every day. And the same thing with trading. Trading is a new experience every day. You're always learning. So the same thing with entrepreneurship. And, um, you know, it's problem solving, you know, taking risks. I mean, you can't have great reward without taking risks. And, you know, it's their sacrifices. And it's not easy. And I, and I always tell everyone that, you know, a lot of people glorify entrepreneurship. I mean, yeah, you have, you have so many benefits. You have, I mean, I love it, but there are a lot of challenges and sacrifices. I mean, I'm working 11 o'clock at night. Sometimes this past week I've been, cause I launched my podcast. Um, this could be a podcast as well on the Rosho podcast. Um, but I launched it and I'm, you know, I'm delegating as much as possible. I launched a few businesses simultaneously, which I actually think is easier. I have a great team of people and I delegate and I'm basically making decisions, executive decisions um, throughout the day. Um, but I'm still having to oversee a lot of projects right now. And so I'm working, you know, overtime. But I know that at some point it's all going to pay off. It's all going to be much easier. But you have to put in that effort now. Um, and, you know, we're all for it. You know, this is part of the process. And there's so much greater glory in delaying that gratification. And there's like that marshmallow test people talk about. It's a great experiment. I think it's Stanford. And, you know, it's about the marshmallow. Can you wait? And if you wait, you're going to get two marshmallows if you don't eat that one marshmallow. So um, that's, that's, you know, serial entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship, you know, it, it's the greatest thing to me. And I've never had a boss. And I'll tell you, out of college, I was studying my graduate program, Decision Information Sciences, and they recommended NSA, I think. Yeah, National Security. Yeah, and they recommended all these employers. And I started looking at the applications. And I was just like, I just don't want this. I, it's just not for me. I just want to always be independent and do my own thing. And um, so from college, I started with real estate investing, development, and, you know, the whole fixer upper, flipping homes, buying properties, renting them out, getting a cash flow. And I did that. Right. And when I went to school in college, it was a great college town. So um, and it worked out and it was well, I mean, it worked out well. And let me tell you, when you say you're living without a couch, Frank and I did that plenty of times. <laughs> we would have we would be moving. We even drove the truck across country. We we traveled across country like like maybe uh, 10 times. Who knows? We moved to California. We lived in Florida. We lived in Seattle. Uh, we lived in the middle of the country. I mean, we lived all over. And um, we were consultants for a while. And we traveled around for this franchise company. Um, but, you know, um, it was exciting. And that's about life. It's about experiencing life. And, um, you know, I think um, it's Frank's turn to fill in the blanks that I probably left or, or take it to the next level. So please go on, Frank. Thank you. Well, I, I don't think entrepreneurship is for everyone per se, you know, because there's a certain risk and comfort level, uh, you know, even though you really are at risk if you are an employee, so to speak, you know, but it's for everyone, you know, everyone else's, you know, life experience, their opinions and what they like as an employee. Um, if a business is going to stay in business and remain in business, you have to generate money for the business above and beyond what your salary is, right? And then you got to also be covering the employer's share of Social Security, of unemployment, state unemployment, 
Uh, in New York, we have this IS interest assessment surcharge from the unemployment now. So any employee, you're, you know, the employer's covering all these things and you have to, so, you know, so, and then the business, again, if it's going to stay in business and be successful, uh, has to be getting more than that too. So, you know, so the employees, will, you know, maybe happy getting whatever it is, um, $50 an hour or whatever it is, you know that the business has to be getting significantly more if it's going to be profitable. Uh, so whatever perks you're getting, you know, and again, this is not said with animosity. There's no reason to be jealous. It is what it is. I mean, that's how a business stays in business uh, because the business bears the risk and the burden. Those who are willing to take the risk and bear the risk, right, have the ability, um, go on the other side. That's fine. But, you know, most businesses do fail for a reason. It may not be for everyone and the risk tolerance. Uh, and, and it's a lot of responsibility, let me tell you, when you have people that are dependent on you for their livelihoods and they have children or grandchildren or whatever it may be or family members that, you know, their dinner is on you, so to speak, right? So while that's uh, great to be, yes, I'm in charge and I'm this and that, at the same time, you look at it the other way, you know, um, as the, the Bible says, you know, to that which much is given, much is expected, right? So, you know, not, of course, not all businesses and people run things that way, but, you know, that's the way we, we do it. So, yeah, so technically, you know, by all accounts, I've retired, but I'm always active, always doing things, always leading by example, always volunteering my time to help people. And I always tell them the same thing when they're like, oh, just thank you. Thank you so much. It's like, look, don't thank me. You have an obligation now that you need to help when you have the chance later on. And even if you don't have the chance, you find a way to help when you're back on your feet and, you know, you just spread good and, um, you know, and, and listen, lost money, made money, lost money, made money, money comes and goes. The only thing I know I've always lost though is time. No matter what I do, always lose on time. Time is the most precious commodity uh, or asset, whatever you want to call it. Um, so Perfect segue to investing. Passive income is so important. Uh, make money with your mind, not your time. And even if you don't do it full time and it isn't your main hustle, it could be a side hustle. And Brennan, you speak about investing. You, you speak about reducing debt and about investing. I think most of your, your tweets lately have the word investing in them. And could you please share with us your thoughts on investing and what you're looking at and during these difficult times because difficult times always bring opportunities yeah that's a that's a good uh segue and i i totally agree and emphasize that is every time somebody's panicking or the masses per se are panicking there's definitely an opportunity sitting right in front of you and so the the big thing with investing for me goes back to financial freedom. It's like, what are we investing for? You know, back to the very, very beginning when I said money's a tool. And so where are you going to put it? You know, if you look at your balance sheet and you kind of assess it that way, I think a lot of people just assess as a dollar in a bank account. Um, but we really look at your comprehensive balance sheet, your net worth, you know, where your net worth stems from. You can understand where all your assets are and cash is just another asset. And so where are you going to best allocate those resources is the question and then how fast do you want to go? You know, what are your goals? That kind of gets you into what kind of accounts, what kind of allocations you have and, and so forth. And so the biggest thing with investing, guys, is if, if you want that financial freedom, that passive income, true passive income um, through whether it be through dividends or with drawdowns in the portfolio, eventually, once it gets a big enough balance, you have to start now. And so time is the biggest wealth building factor by a long shot. And there's nothing that comes close to it. So the return that you get um, isn't going to come close to the time that you have on your side, as well as contribution. And so I typically talk about the wealth triangle when it comes to investing in its time contribution. So that's totally controllable on your end is, hey, let's educate ourselves as fast as possible. So we have the most time possible. And then let's put as much money as we possibly can that aligns with our goals. Those are the first two pieces. The other one is asset percent return, which we all know is dependent on the situation, the market, what you're in, all those kind of things. But at the end of the day, two of those three biggest powerful tools are totally controllable things that you guys can start today. And so if you begin this process, you're going to have dividends hit on a quarterly basis, or maybe a monthly basis that literally pay you 
money that you wouldn't have had otherwise if you didn't put your money to work. And so eventually that grows and compounds and the compound interest everyone talks about is such a beautiful thing. And it's a work of art when you actually look back and see kind of the uptrend of that is in the beginning, it feels very, very uh, daunting because you don't see a lot of activity and you just started and you, you're seeing how everyone online posts about all these dividends, but realize this stuff takes time. Just like I said, the number one you know, piece of wealth building is time. So those individuals have either put a lot of money in or they've had a lot of time on their side. And if you don't have either one of those at this moment, don't get discouraged, but let that be a, a motivating factor to you, as, you know, in five years, in 10 years, in 15 years, between your contribution and your time, you're going to start to see that passive income come to you. And that's the coolest thing about it. As I laid with my daughter this morning at, you know, 6 a.m. watching Miss Rachel, I was able to realize, hey, my money is actively working for me at this current moment. There's nothing I'm literally doing besides laying here. But if it wasn't invested, if I didn't have money in the stock market, um, in other investments out there, I'd have to wake up really fast and I had to run to work at a job and somehow create active income. And that's not something I want to do my whole life. I want to spend the time with the family, uh, spend time where it matters and make sure the money is just a tool to get me from point A to point B and make sure that we can feed our family and we live the life that we want to do. And so I think investing is one of the best things you possibly can do, whether it be even stock market investing or real estate investing or investing in yourself, your education, your knowledge, your skill set that will make you more money, that will become, you know, give you the skills and um, knowledge to become more profitable as well. And so find, I, I think I tweeted one of the most practical pieces of advice this morning. If you want to get somewhere, right, if you want to quit your nine to five, if you want to invest, if you want to build market in, or stock market investing uh, wealth, if you want to build real estate, go find people that have actually done it. Rosanna, Frank, um, I see Lauren in here. She's done it with real estate. And just go ask them how they did it and either pay for their time or join their circle, whether it be a, a social circle that you were able to join because you can provide value of some sort or pay for their time. It is one of the most practical ways to getting ahead in this world is just finding somebody that has exactly what you want. They have the practical blueprint versus, hey, this theoretical stuff. Um, and they can actually get you to your goals way faster. And the cost you pay them is a smidge of what you're going to make if you get you know if you're obviously seeking the right type of people and so i always say is guys there's two commodities in this world is uh time and money you're going to pay with one of them so choose and be wise of which one you pay at what time i love it money's a tool agree completely i always say that that's not the end result you know it's using that as a tool money is a tool to buy you time and, you know, passive income um, is important. And we, we are real estate investors and we have been for, I don't know, what, 25 years? Um, who knows? I mean, even before then, um, Frank was involved before he even, we even met. Um, real estate's an excellent passive income. I actually call it semi-passive because even if you have a management company, you still have to be somewhat involved at some point. Um, I'm very specific with my terms. Um, you know, but overall, it, you're not working for that. So it's considered under the, the, the IRS's category of passive. So absolutely is passive. Um, and then options trading, I think is um, writing options is great. And I like to utilize that against my long positions. I sell cover calls. I also sell, I do bull put spreads, you know, all kinds of credit spreads. Uh, I am an options trader as well. I just recently got I passed a Series 65 exam for investment advisor, so I will be starting an investment advisory firm. There's another one to add to that. I have a podcast. I have rosannaprestia.com um, membership site for investment and entrepreneurship. I also do consulting and advising, um, coaching for CEOs and executive officers. And the reason why I do that is because I love the process. I love it. And I've done it so long that it becomes expertise-based intuitive decision-making and it becomes natural. You just feel it and you can feel that process. So I love, like Brendan said, I have a network of people and I just, I share my time, you know, on Twitter, I'm here. This is all, you know, just to help others share knowledge and experiences. And we have a great network. And I always, I told Brendan, um, you know, we're all part of the network together. And he's so helpful with me, bringing me, uh, showing me all the social media stuff because he's so good with it. You're amazing, Brennan, with everything you do um, with all of this stuff. And I learned so much from you. And, you know, we all learn from each other, regardless of our age and our experience. It's about being humble and knowing that, like, 
we can always learn more. And I'm always learning. I'm learning from so many of you. And Brennan, you're, you're awesome. You're awesome. I'm just going to say that. Um, so, you know, it's risk reward. You know, right now we're about wealth preservation is very important. But I diversified my portfolio, um, you know, between stocks, the 60, 40 is a little bit reduced, you know, I'd say significantly reduced right now. There's a, alternative asset classes. Real estate's a big portion um, of that. Also dividend stocks I and mean, B- BDCs, closed-end funds, unit investment trusts. There's so much out there. And I always look for higher yields with lower management fees and a historical record of them, them the companies main t- or the ETFs maintaining them. Um, and ETFs are a great way to get into that. Um, fixed income. There's so much out there. If you just put a portion of your money, if you save and you invest it, there are a lot of opportunities. So bear market, these times, you know, you could definitely find those opportunities for the long term. So just stay positive and know that there are better times coming ahead. There always are. Look at history. So I'll pass it off to Frank. All right. I don't know how to, how I can keep following up with Brennan and then with you. There's so much stuff that you guys cover, and I don't want to, you know, bore anyone. Um, was there anything in particular you'd like to hear about? Or, so, yeah. D- Brennan, I want to go into estate planning. You had an amazing tweet the other day that I retweeted, and I told people about it, and about trust versus probate. And I'd love for you to just speak a little about that and the importance of trust and their benefits over probate, please, yes. from your perspective. Yeah, absolutely. So I think I shared that tweet in the uh, thing above, but this is a pretty long thread, guys, and I want to hit the bullet points uh, because I know Frank's obviously in the business, and he can probably speak on it in detail even more. But the biggest thing is you know, estate planning and, and preparing for the inevitable, which is death, right, and with your, your family's assets and how do you pass on generational wealth, which is another thing he talked about, um, was one of the things leaving a legacy. And so however you feel like that about that topic, right, the, one of the main things is a will and a trust. And, you know, we can get into the details and the complications of both of them and stuff like that. But I'm going to keep it pretty high level um, so that it makes sense and it resonates with somebody out there as, you know, instead of getting into the technical jargon. OK, so first things first is um, what's probate? The word probate, uh, Rosanna just threw out there, right? So. Probate's a court process. It's basically the court process of administering um, your estate when you die. So we have two options. We can give the state all of the rights in the world to control and seize our assets at death and decide where they go, or we can get a trust and basically dictate the directive of where those things go. And so that's a decision we have to make ourselves. Um, you know, we have wills as well, kind of a lower level tier of, of a trust in a sense. Um, but when it comes to a trust, you know, the, the three reasons you want to um, have one or that, you know, you don't, you want to avoid probate, right? That's a, a big piece because probate, like I said, is when the courts actually administer your estate and that's a very lengthy process. And it can also often turn into an expensive process. And when you got to think when you pass away, the last thing your, your heirs want to do is deal with the court, the, all the details with it. And so if you don't have that, if you don't have a trust and it goes through probate, um, you're going to deal with, you know, the public record of your estate, which for some people, they don't want that, right? Um, so the probate process, the entirety of the process is public record. And they can see your property, finances, family, and all that kind of stuff. So privacy is important. You want to avoid that. Um, number two is you want to, from a time delay perspective, it takes, it's, you're putting it in the state's hand, right? And that's never a good thing. So you want to retain control because if not, they're going to take their sweet time um, you know, bring your family through the mud. And that's not something you want to put your family in that position. Uh, and then lastly, attorney fees. Attorney fees are, they're not cheap. The reality is they're going to be expensive and uh, you don't want to spend a ton of money on that. So you want to be proactive about this decision. Set this up now, um, set this up early on and make sure you're in a good position and put your family more so in a good position come um, that time. So how do you avoid the actual probate is obviously through a trust like I, I talked about, right? And what are some benefits? Like we talked about the privacy of that. Um, now tax efficiency is very interesting a component of this. And, you know, you might've heard, this is a, a more practical example, but you know, somebody puts their home in a trust, they gift it to somebody and therefore the capital gains in that are not taxed. And it just, 
um, the new the error receives that at, at the new cost basis. And that's a benefit of a trust, for example, in practical real life stuff. But trusts are invisible to the IRS, essentially. Um, they, they're not going to report the gains, losses, gift taxes, or income taxes on assets sold in a trust, which is huge. Uh, and so t- tax efficiency might be one of those benefits that you're looking for. Uh, distribution control, right? Uh, you don't have to distribute your assets outright. You can actually customize this process, which is a beautiful thing. You can say exactly when, where, who, what, all those kind of details. Uh, and that's a really, really awesome thing from a par- parental perspective. Instead of just saying, you know, the, the, with a will, you get everything at, you know, when I pass or whatever the assets you, you put in there that will is, you can actually have very, a lot of customization to this. You know, Sally gets $20,000 at 35 and at 45 or whatever that may be, right? Um, and that's a really, really good piece of the, uh, of the, of the trust benefit. Uh, asset protection. Um, when your estate is probated, all debtors and creditors must be notified um, so they can make those claims. But they don't need to be notified if there's an assets or in a trust. And they, this shields your assets from being used to pay off debts, which is a, a beautiful thing. Um, and again, another benefit. And then lastly, avoiding probate altogether. The time, money, stress that you put your, your family through. Uh, it's something you want to avoid if at all costs. Um, you got to remember the situation we're referring to, which is makes a lot of people uncomfortable, but it's death. And so, you know, you could put yourself, you you could put yourself in the best possible position. It's kind of like financial freedom and money, right? There's, you know, money's tough and and life's tough in general, but there's controllables out there. And one of those is money and finances. And if you can control the controllables and actually take advantage of what you can control, life becomes easier. And so same thing with a trust or, you know, planning, estate planning for your family is, make it the easiest possible thing for them because it, they already are dealing with grief. They're already dealing with a lot of stuff that comes to uh, the, your mind when it comes to death. I just went to my grandma's funeral literally two weeks, weekends ago. Right. And the last thing I'd want to think about is how do I distribute her state estate? Like there's not a chance in the world. That was what I was thinking as I was doing the first reading. And so I really encourage anybody out there with a family that's just getting started building their assets to speak with a trust attorney, um, put this stuff on paper, get your, get your estate in, in order and make sure that you're putting your family in the best possible position. Thank you so much for that. Um, this is actually one topic that, you know, I really don't, I don't really deal with much. Cause you know, when you're married, it's just like, you know, you're with your wife, when you're married to someone who that's their area and that's one of their focus areas, um, that's not really for me. So I'm going to pass it right off to Frank. Please tell us um, your input on trusts and all that. Please. Thank you. Okay, sure. Yeah. So excellent points, Brennan, on, on all fronts regarding that. Um, again, I used to be uh, series six and 63 uh, licensed with the insurance as well um, in the past. So one thing, and I am not now, but one thing I used to tell people as well regarding trusts and insurance is what about the funeral expenses? Do you know how expensive a funeral is? Who's going to pay for that? You know, by the time you wait for probate to figure everything out, it's way down the line. So I know you were talking about how to administrate the estate. Well, what about paying for the funeral? And that's really a tough time. And um, so with the trusts, uh, yeah, again, states vary. uh, And then there's uh, community property states as well, but you know, you have living trusts, bypass trusts, um, you can try to do things through businesses, uh, you know, uh, your beneficiary of your accounts, right? In New York, it's like a Totten trust, uh, but you know, you're payable on debts uh, for your accounts. That's a way of avoiding uh, probate as well. And then you have, um, you know, the estate taxes, uh, you know, you're already paying taxes while you're alive than when you pass you're going to have to pay more estate taxes depending on how much you have. Um, So it's important not to contribute to them. And what I mean by that is, for example, a simple fix is life insurance, right? You, let's say, have a a policy and you own it. Well, if you pass um, and it's it's part of your estate, whereas if uh, your beneficiary owns it, right? Let's say, um, you know, let's say my kids own a life insurance policy on me. Should I pass? They don't pay estate taxes on it. Um, but if I own it, and you know, I guess Rosanna and I both pass whatever, if I pass first, it goes to Rosanna, then when she passes, they're going to be paying taxes on it. 
uh, just simple things that you can go and avoid any sort of uh, probate with that. And then with the trust, the other things that you can do with trusts, um, if you get an irrevocable trust where you don't have um, actual power to do certain things, it will also give you credit protection uh, from creditors while you're alive as well. But um, the last point about this, uh, what I noticed, and one reason I, I also became an entrepreneur from an earlier age, is just from working at firms, I noticed that the people who needed the estate planning, who really got the estate planning, were business owners. They weren't necessarily the doctor unless the doctor had a practice. It wasn't the attorney, except if the attorney had a practice. So it was the business owners were the ones that actually overwhelmingly needed the estate planning where they were worried about estate taxes and needed um, you know, those type of policies. So, but yeah, definitely avoiding probate regarding getting the money for the funeral, uh, administrating things definitely good there's nothing nefarious about doing that it's just smart planning and that's all i have to say thank you so much see i leave everything up to him regarding the trust and everything um but yeah he's also an attorney um and he does all that stuff as well so thank you so much brennan brilliance as always you're amazing and thank you to frank as well you guys both um i think covered almost everything i think everything uh, in that area um and I, I just want to pass it off to you, Brennan, in case I missed anything that you wanted to say, because I'm just going to say, before you go on, I wanted to say, your energy is amazing. Your passion is just all around you, and you ignite that in other people. So just want to say, you're awesome, you're amazing, and you're going to be even better in time. Um, so, um, so excited to have you as a friend, call you a friend and to be in our network of, uh, brilliant entrepreneurs. So I just want to pass it off to you. What else do you want to add? Yeah. Thanks. Know? Thanks Rosanna. And honestly, this is, it's a, it's just awesome to be part of you guys and, you know, speaking with brilliant minds like yourself, this is just incredible. So first things first is thank you for just giving me this platform opportunity. Uh, second thing guys is anybody out there struggling with finances, anybody struggling with, uh, debt investing, not knowing where to get started. Just remember this, this game shouldn't be hard. And if it is, you just don't have access to the right education resources or people. And it's all right in front of you. So if you ever need any help, um, I'm always there to help and just send me a DM. I'm pretty, I'm, I answer pretty quickly. Uh, and I'm always looking to help people. So if you guys need anything, never feel lost, never feel like you can't do this. You absolutely can put your mind to it. Um, and again, back to the very, very initial point is focus on your mission, whatever that mission is today, make sure every Thing that you do, everything that you think about, and every task that you um, bring onto your calendar is in line with that mission that you have. Thank you, guys. Love it. Love it. You know, it's about grit. It's about having that, you know, resiliency. And I call it anti-fragile. I love Nassim Taleb. Um, as Frank said, we read a lot of books, and I love reading all these great minds. Uh, philosophy as well. Um, Marcus Aurelius, amazing. Stoicism, all that. But it's very important. The reason why I mentioned stoicism and I mentioned the anti-fragile, it's about, you know, reducing those impulses. It's not about reducing the emotions. It's about reducing the impulses, that reaction, that quick, fast reaction. And, you know, we're humans. We can actually increase that time between what happens to us and our reaction. We can't control what happens to us. But we can definitely control our reaction to those events. And, you know, hey, I make mistakes too. You know, it's all part of the process. And, you know, just keep going for it, going stronger and better. And every failure, every mistake only makes you better. Learn from it and be accountable and never give up. So that's all I have to say. Frank, do you want to wrap this one up? Yeah, sure. Thanks, sweetie. Um, yeah, I just want to reemphasize what uh, Brendan was saying that, you know, essentially like he, he speaks about mission and, you know, whatever your goals are, whatever you want to achieve, just make sure they align with your values. I know I'm not the first person who said that um, there's no there's no point in accomplishing goals that don't align with your values and that are going to give you fulfillment. So um, and I think that's that's about it. Thank you so much. Well, thank so I'll you wrap for this up. Me.
You're welcome. I'll wrap this up with, in the famous words of Charlie Munger, best thing a human being can do is help another human being no more. And I hope that's what we accomplished here today. And um, we thank you all for joining.